welcome everybody to Not So Famous Achievers. Weekly conversations with some of the world's most amazing but not so famous achievers on what they did and how they did it and what you can learn from their journey. With your hosts, Will Christ and Robert White. Hey guys. Oh, well, good morning. Good morning. We're going to have a great conversation today with Michelle Saunders Gotchevs, uh, who is the founder and the CEO of Altered States Ministry, headquartered in the middle of this wonderful country. So, welcome, Michelle. Welcome. How are you today? Well, I'm having a ball. I have a ball good. every day. Okay. So, so tell us, Michelle, tell us about this wonderful thing that you have called Altered Stories Ministry. This is not Altered States Ministry, right? Right. It, you, you got it. Altered <laughs> Stories. <laughs> Altered Stories. <laughs> yes. So tell us about how how this came to you, and then we'll explore what it's what is this about. So, I would love this. Um, thank you. Uh, Altered Stories Ministry is a faith-based nonprofit located in um, Overland Park, Kansas. It's been out there for about three years, and I'm the CEO and founder of this ministry. And how it started was through the power of my story and what I saw when I shared it. And I have a story of coming out of a cult. I'm a childhood cult survivor. And I was in a cult from the age of seven to 12. Mm. The cult um, was uh, called the Ecclesia Group, and it is no longer around. It was disbanded. And I, through my mom's influence, came, became involved in this cult and experienced a whole different life. Mm. Um, as a result of being part of this group of dysfunctional leaders, mm. people who were all extremely vulnerable. And as a result of um, being exposed to this cult, I experienced trauma. I ex experienced abuse. I saw abuse. Um, others in my family experienced it. Mm. And unfortunately, um, we were, this was all innocent at first. It all seemed warm and welcoming. And then it started to get hard, really, really hard. And, and as a result of that trauma that I went through, um, I had to deal with when my mother made the choice to leave the cult uh, after we were in it for about five years, mm -hmm. I had to deal with all of what I encountered in terms of emotions and um, other wounds that I had um, from what I had experienced in being sexually violated mm -hmm. and seeing that happen to my family in seeing that happen to others, in seeing what, you know, other people dealt with in terms of humiliation and, you know, just other traumatizing things. Um, but anyway, when our family made the decision, my mom, of course, I'm going to collectively do, call that my family, of course, um, made that decision to leave um, there. There was just a lot that we had to deal with in terms of moving forward in our lives. My parents' marriage, my mother's own issues. She was actually brainwashed in my brother leaving because my parents lost custody of him and mm -hmm. my sister and I. And so we had to, you know, go forward. And instead of getting healthy counseling and sitting down, what we did is we just continued to immerse ourselves in going forward. And I didn't recognize and realize that all of what I encountered was pretty difficult in terms of um, what I was experiencing in 
my future life. Mm-hmm. And um, I was seeing, you know, just exhibited behaviors. I was having difficulty focusing. I was having anxiety and depression. I was r- raging. Um, my mom and I had a terrible relationship. Um, it was very hard um, for me to try to figure out where I could go to get help. Hmm. And later on through the years, I actually had to meet with a counselor, go through stress management counseling. And that's when the power of my story and what I revealed to this counselor, I started seeing how healing it was Mm -hmm. and how important it was for me to share so I could get the help that I needed and the support from this Christian counselor and then do what I needed to do to begin to heal. Mm. And that also included my mom's, my relationship with my mom and other relationships that I had prior. And more importantly, my relationship with God, because I did not, I hated Christians. Mm -hmm. I didn't think God loved me. I didn't think there was, God was a good God. And it took a while for me to get trust back. Um, And so I had to work through all of those emotions. But the reason I bring this all up in the backstory is because as a result of me breaking free through telling and sharing, I was so fearful of the, the outcome of me sharing this story. And what it would do to my family and what people would think of me and how my career would go and all of those things that I found an incredible amount of freedom when I shared it. And then when I started seeking out ways to be able to also help others who've come through those kinds of circumstances. And I did that through some of what I was doing in my church volunteer work, in some of the women's groups, in some of uh, my um, church um, groups that I was involved in as well. So that helped me realize how important the power of story is Mm -hmm. and how important it is to share it safely, share it, and to tell it to be able to help you move forward because I was just almost like a deer in the headlights frozen. You know what I'm saying? I just, I could only go so far in my life. And when I started journaling and writing and doing all those things that were important and started going in and speaking and, you know, helping others, it really freed me up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I really felt that it was important to help others and specifically women who've been through trauma heal and to listen to them and show empathy and care and to give them a voice. And that led me to why I wanted to get involved in healing ministries and to be able to start a nonprofit with a platform that would help women heal through the power of sharing their story. And that's, you know, I've lots of other things behind this. Uh, I was blessed to work in some incredible faith-based nonprofits where I was facilitating sessions, bringing speakers in that had these incredible stories. And I saw what that did to the women. I saw it in the retreats and the board. I served on a board for five years where we brought women in and helped them share. I saw the power of the story when I would go on flights and I would sit next to a woman and she would begin to tell me her story and the struggles. And I would encounter when I was at the beach, I would go to the bathroom and there'd be a woman woman in there and she'd start telling me about her whole lupus story. I would be at the pool and there was a woman going through a divorce and she needed somebody who cared and started telling me, and I guess there's a gift that I have as a result of going through that, that I've been trying to use to help 
the world be a better place and women to be all that they're intended to be and walking in full purpose and their God purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Good. Well, it's amazing to me that that it seems to me that that if we don't share our story, then we tend to make up our own uh, re reactions to our story, our own responses to our story, and those are not always good responses. Very often, it's a negative kind of, of, of thought about, well, this is me, and I'm not good because of that. But when we can tell our story, we share our story with somebody who can hear it without getting emotionally involved with it, then it 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 projects it out and makes it something out there rather than only in here. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and that's what to me, that's what what love is about is is being willing to hear somebody else's story without making a judgment about it. Absolutely. I agree with you, Will. And I think this whole movement of Me Too that came to the surface and the forefront started in opening up the doors and there was more awareness around mental health. And I'm such a mental health advocate anyway. You know, I really believe that mental health matters as well as the power of the story and all of that's inclusive. So yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I had so much inside of me and there are other people that carry these stories around, hard stories, mm -hmm. you know, and you can hear 65 of them on my podcast show, The Altered Story Show, that of women who were all bound up and, you know, they just had, and they have really, really hard stories. I mean, hard stories. We all, you know, we live in a fallen world, a broken world, and sometimes people are evil and do things or they do things and they, they're broken. Mm -hmm. And so they don't always realize broken people do hurt others. And that's the other thing. I want these people that I influence to be able to be healthy, emotionally healthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and all over the world, not just, you know, women in the United States, women from all over, mm -hmm. you know. So anyway, it's it's taking what. You know, you encountered the struggle and moving it forward into helping others. And that's why I'm here today. Well, you know, I can, I can, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Uh, uh, one, one is, is just recently, uh, last month, and uh, it was a wonderful opera at the Metropolitan Opera in uh, New York. And, and it, it's, it it really tells a story about uh, about you know a, a, a fellow who who uh, it was uh, Charles Blow wrote the story about his life. Uh, it's called uh, "Fire Shut Up in My Bones," right the, from Jeremiah, the text from Jeremiah, and 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 then um, then then Terence Blanchard turned it into an opera. I think St. Louis Opera commissioned it, but it turned into an opera, and it ran. I got to see it here on, uh, you know, an IMAX movie, uh, IMAX movie uh, theater. But it was very touching. But it's the story, and and until he could get that story out there, he couldn't change it. Right. That is exactly what happens. People are walking so bound up. And there's incredible freedom that happens when you do somehow, even as a creator, as a writer. I mean, yesterday was National Authors Day. It celebrated a lot of the authors in my life. And I hope to be one in about a year mm -hmm. in terms of a published book where I'm going to publish my memoir mm -hmm. and help women heal through my story. But there's just so much, I think, that I've seen through my years of what even younger children, you know, when they're able to share, mm -hmm. you know, what's transpiring or, you know, I try to encourage uh, that kind of communication in a healthy way, you know, too. So, I mean, when I was going through what I was going through at seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, 
11, there was no one to turn to. Mm. I mean, I, I, it was very difficult and my teachers didn't understand. My grades went from being all A's down to C's and D's and behavioral problems. They didn't really understand or look past. You know, there could be something really going on and traumatizing in this young girl's life, you know? So, I mean, I'm grateful for where we are in our culture right now and all the things that we have and all the resources and the awareness and all those things now, because there are, you know, children even, you know, today and others that are in these horrible cults. And, you know, it, I just recently shared a story of a woman who is a highly successful publisher now and uh, had a great turnaround in her life, but she got in a cult and uh, later in life and it destroyed her marriage. It destroyed her family. It destroyed her finances, her reputation, everything. So that's the other thing I want to bring to awareness is that you, there's a real need for people to be discerning mm -hmm. and to really research and think through what you're attaching to in terms of your faith and other, just your business dealings and all those things. Mm -hmm. So a good friend of mine is a Paula Kaplan. Uh, she is a psychiatrist and she works with other psychiatrists, helping them. She wrote a book called when Johnny and Jane come marching home and it's about returning soldiers. Mm -hmm. And here's what she said. She said, Folks come home, they will come to a, a, a party, a greeting, have coffee with somebody, and somebody will say, well, tell me what happened, right? Right. And they said that the soldier, man or woman, will start down the path. They'll get to a place that's uncomfortable, and somebody else, I, said, I don't want to hear anymore. I, I, I can't handle that, which says you are an unhandleable person. You're broken. Right. And she said, what we need to do is we need to have people who will come to a soldier and say, look, I know you've been gone for a while. I'm glad that you're back. I got six hours. I want to hear yes. your story. And yes. she said, it doesn't take a psychiatrist to do that. She said, this is the pattern. She said, you listen to the story. You can ask some questions, but you're listening to the story. She said there will come a point somewhere along the line where some horrendous thing happens. And she said at that point, you probably have to bite your tongue, but you listen. And when that part of the story is finished, you look at that person and you say, you know, if I'd been in your shoes, I would have done the same thing. You yes. are not crazy. Yes, that's so good. She's, oh, yeah, so, so good. It's just empathizing. It's caring. We don't have enough of it. People can't, like you said, they struggle. It's hard to do the stories I do. A lot of podcasters won't touch them, mm. you know, but I'm called to it. Mm -hmm. And there are many others that are too, and other psychologists and therapists and all those that are. So it is that, but you do, you do have to let them share. Well, I mean, one of our traditional paths for doing that in the church has been confession, but we, we yes, forgot we about do it. Was. Well, we forgot about it. We turned it into, yeah. a, we turned it into a negative thing, turned it into a come here and confess your sins as if you are bad, you are broken. So you come here and t just tell us, and then we'll tell you you're okay. Yes. That's not confession to me. Confession is, tell me your story. And as you tell me your story, what I'm going to remind you is, you're loved by God. Yes, yes, and yes. I, it's yes. not a matter of forgiveness, it's a matter of reminding you what's true all along that you just forgot, that you are loved by God. And by the way, I love you too. And it's listening to the story and not falling into judgment, but, but 
recognizing this person was always doing the best that they could possibly do, given the circumstances and what was going on in their life at the time. Love it. Love it. I wish there were a million of you. <laughs> well, because that's the way we should be. Yeah. That's why I think women receive me because they know I care and I love them. God loves them. I understand. And when you go through trauma, one of the things that transpires is there's a need to talk about it. Okay. If you've ever run across anyone who's lost a child mm -hmm. or anyone going through a divorce or mm -hmm. anyone going through, you know, something very traumatizing themselves, mm -hmm. unemployment, financial setbacks, you know, drug addiction, alcohol, all those things, maybe a health setback, you know, COVID, you know, I mean, there's just a need to talk about it, you know, and nobody wants to take the time to hear it. You know, people, people, they need to talk about it and, and it's hard. And yes, it's like some say, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but, but how else do you work through it if you don't have yeah, a way? To me, I think two things come up. One is, we don't take time to be with others because we're so busy doing. Absolutely, we are. I had a very good friend who came back from uh, visiting his father. He had not been to his father's town in a small rural village in Egypt for 20 years. And his mother's family was all here, so that's where he went. But he said, I'm going back and I'm gonna spend I'm gonna spend two weeks in this little village in Egypt. He came back and told us about it, and he said, You know what's amazing is these people, they don't have brand new televisions, their television's maybe 20 years old, they still have VHSs. And he said, But they see each other every day and they spend more time being together than doing together. And he yes. says, here, for us to see each other, we have to get on calendars, and it may be two or three weeks before we can squeeze each other in, because we're so busy doing. Which I want to share something, uh -huh. too, that I found. When you're a Christian, as a Christian, as a faith-based person, that's where your relationship with God comes in mm -hmm. because as a personal, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in your life, you can go directly to him in prayer mm -hmm. or in just in your quiet time or in your devotional or whatever and write out or speak. You know, that's, I mean, I think that is beneficial and been beneficial for some who haven't found that person that they can speak to, or there's no one to talk to. I mean, there's books, there's resources, and there's other ways too that, you know, I have found in my own life and others have found too. But I, I'm not negating, I believe that God sends people to us in our lives to help us through when we're going through difficulty. And I do think that makes a, a really great, uh, it, it, it makes a, a difference in the healing process as well. If you know that there's someone else, a higher power, you know, that has your back or right. cares, or you can go through that. We, we are you know. all part of the divine, right? Yes, we're yes, we are. Part. I mean, yes. we are there. And, and any time that I'm listening to somebody, I know that God's listening too. Yes, that's so good. And, and, and so it, it's really, when I'm speaking, when I'm listening, God is part of that conversation. And to me... My being with somebody in a relationship is a way of 
bringing in that divine or acknowledging the presence of that divine, whether yes. they know it or not. I mean, my, uh, I was born on October the 5th and St. Francis Day is October the 4th. So that means to me that I look to St. Francis for so much. And St. Francis said, speak the gospel always. If necessary, use words. Yes. Well, I mean, there's a lot to be said mm -hmm. to that. And I know that our discussion today, we've got the presence of God here. Yes. So, and he uses us. And so that's really powerful too. So these are great conversation. Great yeah. conversation. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a break here and we'll be right back. And then I want to hear more about some specific things that you want to do in the next six to nine months. Well, we're going to give you one quick thought here that uh, plays into what we've been talking about here today. Our two hosts have lived extraordinary lives and been extraordinary entrepreneurs, and Robert White, certainly one of them. He mentors extraordinary entrepreneurs and executives just like you. People who want better results from their leadership performance. He shows them how to turn those results into increased personal joy and satisfaction as well. Robert founded and led two large training industry success stories. He's been there and done that. And his experience will help you find and achieve that extraordinary success you seek in your life. So why wait? Reach out and see what Robert can do for you today. Just email him at robert at extraordinarypeople.com. Robert at extraordinarypeople.com. And start living the extraordinary life you've earned. Does your company have a clear vision? Do you have the right people in the right seats? Are you consistently getting the results you want and enjoying the journey? If not, consider EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. EOS is a set of simple concepts and practical tools used by more than 100,000 companies around the world to clarify, simplify, and achieve their vision. Schedule your free 90-minute meeting with an EOS implementer at eosworldwide.com today. That's eosworldwide.com. And now back to our show. All right, Michelle, so, so tell us, what are you excited about next six to nine months? What do you uh, want this, to be doing? Oh, geez, I love this. Oh, you're, you're such a strategist. I love it. Um, well, you know, I want to be able to continue to increase my listenership um, huh. with the stories that I'm sharing. Um, I'm hoping to be able to, in addition to uh, what I'm doing with the podcast, to get a conference out there, some type of virtual or in-person conference for women to share um, their, learn how to share their stories or to get their inner, learn how to listen or, you know, get their story out for their healing. And so that's something that I hope to have out there in the future and to get going on my book. I've got a publisher, but write that and launch it and it's my altered story, and we're going to work on the memoir and then the ability for anyone picking up the book to go through a healing process to get through um, the book as we go through the different places through my story of healing and redemption and change and transformation. So that's that. I hope to continue to build my um, nonprofit so we can hire a few employees um, and continue to build our volunteer base as we are, you know, are doing right now. So that's it in a nutshell, but, you know, we're always looking for partnerships and business sponsors and growing some of those partnering with others um, as we continue to do that and get my podcast you know, growth all over the world outside of the 40 countries. Well, if you had a magic wand and, and attached to the magic wand was a, a large bucket of cash, as much as you want, what would you do? Oh, geez, I would probably need to sit down with some of my board and we would have to talk through some of our, you know, dreams um, but definitely, 
you know, I would begin to, you know, def get that book out, start funding and helping others that are helping other women heal too. hire the people that are needed, the counselors, the authors, you know, the team, broadcasting team, get the television show out there, you know, do those, just continue to do what I'm doing, but at a much broader level um, to help. I'd also want to give money and funding to certain organizations who are doing incredible work um, in that area of healing and transformation for people. So probably set up a leadership, you know, nonprofit leadership group, all of those things, you know, that I think I can influence. Well, it seems to me that that, that is that is what we would call kingdom work, isn't it? The transformation of people. That kind of work gets gets confusing when people start thinking about profit. Yes, they do. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm saying mm -hmm. it, we become vulnerable to distraction when when you know when we focus on that. But at the same time, when we focus on that transformation and helping people to thrive helping to remove the obstacles in their way. In my experience, when we're clear about where we want to go, and it's not just where we want to go, but where we're called to go, where, where we're doing that thing we were, we came to do, or we're sent to do when we, when we do that, money is not a problem. No, not really. Um, no, there's, but it's, I always believe that money can turn, you know, kingdom, it can help with kingdom work in other ways. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, I'm doing everything I'm doing. I haven't paid, been paid a dime for four and a half years. Right. And doors have opened astronomically for me in so many ways just because of what I'm putting out there in the world. And some people would say, you're absolutely crazy for doing things the way you are, but it is the way that it's It's happened. the way that it works. It's, it's, it's the way it, it is. I mean, and that's, we are crazy. <laughs> St. Francis was crazy. <laughs> we are crazy. That's right. That's exactly right. I <laughs> well, especially when I came from companies like Charles Schwab. And yes. I mean, you know, it's making six figures and I was, you know what I'm saying? I, I just, I think people are, but it's just a different place in my life. It's a different purpose. It's a different calling. Well, it, well, part of the storytelling is to change the narrative, to change the frame, to change the lenses that we use through which to see our lives, right? Yes, absolutely. I had to. And, and, and so, so there are different lenses, different measurements, different uh, world, you know, w different measurements about how what success is, and yes. and and uh, so there are those who who use all sorts of judgmental terms, whether it's crazy or nonprofitable or uh, bad business or what, all sorts of judgments that get in the way when we forget about what we're called to do, how, how we are helping. And for me, it's, it's, it's always helping people transform their lives to be the best they can possibly be. Yes, absolutely. I had to learn it the hard way though. How's I had that? a really hard time. Well, because I was working so hard to, I was putting so much emphasis on, you know, the business side of what I was doing and trying to, because I come out of that and, you know, I used to have $74 million budgets and I'd go out and just create and do all these things. And I had to make that change and that transition in my own life to hold myself valuable just because I wasn't attached to a certain amount of money. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I was putting my identity in that. So and so I had to I had to go through that change and transformation myself. So what amount of money are you connected to now? <laughs> I, 
God. <laughs> I mean, I mean, my husband's oh, my God my husband's. Have God my doesn't husband, have any yeah. money, but God yeah. doesn't have any money. God, God, God doesn't have any money. I mean, we made you know. all the money, not God. I mean, uh, we've got this special world that's outside of creation that we call money, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yes. I just I I think I'm blessed to have some donors and different things and a husband who supports and believes in me and believes in what I'm doing. And we plan and all those things. And we've made accommodations to support yes. for the goodness. And I do believe what you give will come back. Well, I does. just don't put the value and the emphasis on the dollar like I used to. I, I value other things. Well, and also the source of all this money really is the creator. Yes, it is. So, I mean, we're we're talking to the biggest of, of billionaires. The Yes. Yes. Most, we can't even put our head around it. That's right. That's right. And, and I got to tell you, my wife is crazy, too. Oh, I love that. <laughs> she was she was, uh, you know, she's an Episcopal priest as well. And and when she was ordained, uh, the bishop said to her, uh, I want you to go to this church in Riverside that I have shut down. Now, she had a full-time job as uh, the in a uh, the, in a college, in university, you know, Cal Baptist University, as a uh, in the education department, and and but he said, I want you to go to the church in Riverside that I've shut down because they were all fighting with each other and they didn't need to, you know, they weren't doing the right thing. So he said, I shut the church down, but the building's there, and I want you to go there. I want you to feed the hungry, I want you to clothe the naked, and I want you to feed uh, teach the children. And she said, oh, that's just wonderful. I love doing that. I mean, by that time, she was a grandmother. And so she said, that's that's exactly why I wanted to go through seminary and become a priest. I'm ready. And he said, now, you, you, won't, you, you won't have a salary. And there won't be any money from the diocese to pay for this. And you can't start a congregation because there's several other churches in town. And she said... Well, okay, I, I want to. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about about feeding the hungry, and uh, clothing the naked, and teaching the children. That's great, but no, no salary, no uh, budget from the diocese, and and I can't start a congregation. How, Bishop? How do you see me doing that? And he said, Well, I don't know, but I want you to get in your car and drive from L.A. to Riverside and. And you and the Holy Spirit figure it out. But that was 10 years ago. She has fed thousands and thousands of people with food that's been given, just comes to her, all of this. They are also halfway through building a 50-unit apartment house that will house low-income people for long-term housing. $8 million dollars. That just happened. And if you say to her, oh, look at all the great things you've done, she would say, I didn't do anything. I just stood in the middle and prayed. I love it. <laughs> Crazy and that's woman. The way, yeah, well, that's the way it should be. I mean, look at Mother Teresa. Uh-huh. And I mean, truly, I mean, every day I get up, it's a huge walk of faith. Yes. And I even had a dream that I would have, I mean, this dream came to me. It's unbelievable. And, and there is going to be a site, a location. Uh And, you know, I do believe God does speak to us all differently, but I am visionary very much see things out in the future. Uh Um, And I've been that way my whole life. I've always seen visions and, you know, in that way, but I know there's, this is coming. It's been, Many prophetic words, many beyond my expectations, but it's not about me. No. This is not about me. This is about God. This is I'm in his creation. He's just using me because I'm a willing vessel. And this is what I feel for my calling. And it, I just have faith and well, trust. The creator uses is ready to use all of us. In fact, uh, we are part of the creation. We're not separate from it. 
No, we're all together. And, and, and part of part of the consequences, I believe, that we're experiencing right now that we call climate change and global warming, part of that is because we kind of forgot our connection to the rest of the of of the planet or the rest of the cosmos, right? It's uh, uh, we forget all of that and, and only do it for ourselves. Yes, that is very true. And, There's a and, lot of self-serving. We sort of get off, get off the, get off the road. And if you get off the road, there're going to be consequences for it. I mean, you can't just keep driving down the road if you're off the road. So I, I but on the same, at the same time. I am no longer afraid of what's coming because we have all this wonderful nature, all the cosmos around us that seems to keep on going, whether the temperature goes up or down. Yes, that is so true. And I've learned a lot more about that. <laughs> Living in the forest, I live yeah. in the kind of the forest area of this whole metro uh -huh. Uh -huh. and i've learned a lot more i've been in the mountainside and of course i love the ocean but living in a day-to-day -day area yes it's, it's it's really a different kind of thinking too it's being connected yeah it, it's truly taught me a lot of things and i know there's purpose around that too so well, theologically we tend to to get all caught up in in who are we as human beings but Theologically, in the larger sense, uh, every creature is loved by the Creator. Yes. And go back to Genesis and well, yeah, read it. Yeah, we have yeah. the opportunity to to join in that conversation and that 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 loving experience when we reconnect with nature and reconnect it, with the cosmos. And so that's a healing thing too. Yes. Just so you know, because I knew when. Um, I was so, when I was very, you know, wounded and needed to be healed through my, you know, relationship with Christ and um, other areas, I started noticing things differently. I started yeah. appreciating differently started relationships. You started I was. Yes. Yeah, God knew that. And so, you know, I think that's an indicator, too. That's another indicator. I think what we're going to see in the next five to 10 years is we're going to see a process of healing our relationship with our fellow creatures on this planet, all the way from the smallest bacterium and virus, all the way up to all the large animals and plants. We're going to rediscover our relationship with nature. Well, that's a God's creation is everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> and you don't, I, I, I do think that it does something to you too. Uh -huh. And it's very um, ministering is so precious. Yeah. I mean, the, this year I noticed more, my mother passed almost three years ago and you hear about the Cardinals, right? I don't know what you might know, but the Cardinal birds, uh -huh. Some people say they're messengers from heaven when uh -huh. a loved one. But I know when I, from time to time, am in certain places in terms of my meditation with the Lord and other things, um, I will, there'll be a cardinal that'll just kind of show up. Yes. I mean, <laughs> it's us. and my daughter who, recently lost her beloved rescue boxer. Uh -huh. He ran away and we all think he did that to die. He uh -huh. was, it was very traumatizing, but she didn't know where he was. And she saw a Cardinal like a day later and she said, mom, this never happens to me. <laughs> and it was like, I had this piece that Buster was okay. Yeah. Buster right. did is is in it is is in the Rainbow Bridge, yeah. you know, or you know, <laughs> right. yeah. Right. I mean, I just 
it's going to be I think we're having all. really amazing conversation, Will. I don't know if people have these conversations, but this is phenomenal. Oh, good. Well, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it, because I certainly do. That's what I do all day long, is have great conversations with people all around, all around the world. I just got off a conversation with somebody from India who is doing such great things over there in business. I'm so excited about that. So. Oh, that's so cool. I yeah. love people from India. Yeah. I, I, I've i met several throughout my career and a few women, yeah. and I hope to have more of those women on the podcast too. And uh, is it amazing? More. Is it amazing yes. what we can do? Oh, yeah. Uh, I it's, mean, it, uh, how can you get up and not go? Right. <laughs> this is just every day. Yes. It is. It's an amazing world. It's an it amazing it light. Really I, yeah. you're like me. I'm just hoping I, my, at your age, I will have your mindset uh, and continue to keep, keep that. I'm, I'm, I'm right now at, at 75. I'm looking forward to what's the next 25 years going to be. I'm beginning to figure out where I'm being led for that. So fun that's you know, this good. has been so much fun so glad to to be with you if somebody had a story that they wanted to tell or they wanted to share something with you or talk more with you or or even are called to help support this ministry what would they do well they can reach out to us and me through our website www.alteredstories.org i'm also i've got a facebook public page you can reach me on my public page. You can reach me through my Instagram account. I have a public page there. Uh, those are key. I'm very open to conversations, re- building relationships, learning more about others. Nice. And we'll always welcome people who are interested in the calling I am doing. Super. So. Well, this is just another example of a wonderful conversation. Some of those wonderful, not so famous yet, achievers. Yes. <laughs> what does famous mean? <laughs> You're famous. We're all. <laughs> well, there you have it. Another great example of why you got to tune in. Over here, some conversations with maybe some not so famous but real achievers like our guest today. Right here in Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.